All right. I think we're live, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for our first ever uh, streamed book club. I'm very excited about this, and I have to now announce uh, and introduce my friends to you guys. Um, so first of all, we all met in college um, in some way, shape, or form, and we've stayed in touch, and these are some of my very, very best friends. So uh, first of all, I thought it'd be fun to like introduce my friends kind of one by one, and everybody's being so nice, saying hello, ladies. Thank you. <laughs> hello, Lindsay's buddies. So here, I'll tell you their names. First of all, we've got Vivian. Da -na 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 -na. <laughs> She's got her book. She's ready. Um, yeah. A fun story about Vivian is I met Vivian my freshman year of college, and you were actually the first person I met at BYU, like the very first person. I know, same here. Because, <laughs> like, I had driven up with my mom. I was walking in, like, with my first set of boxes to move into my dorm, and Vivian met me in the elevator. <laughs> and she was so sweet. She was just like, hi, how are you? How are I'm Vivian. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to be okay. I just made a friend. <laughs> um, but, Vivian, tell, maybe share a little bit. What did you and I used to love to do in college? Oh, okay. There's one thing Lindsay and I used to love, and that was dancing. We would go to every single dance party there ever was. We would hit up maybe three in a night. <laughs> and we weren't there to socialize. We weren't there to make new friends or see our crushes. We were there to dance. We literally <laughs> were drenched in sweat. And it, we did not look cute at the end of it, for sure. Yes, uh, I couldn't have said it better myself. Like literally, people would be like, "Oh, hey, what's up?" And we're just like, "What?" Like, "Oh my gosh!" See you later. Yeah, sorry, I'm spinning. Priorities. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So, welcome, Vivian. Thanks for being Thank here. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. I'm excited. Yes, yes. Uh, next, we've got Caitlin. Caitlin. Ooh. Um, I actually met her on my mission. So Caitlin and I both served our missions in New York City. And um, I, she was my last companion on my mission, which was crazy. Um, but my favorite companion, I'll say that much. <laughs> you know, I was, anytime I talk to people, I'm like, don't say that out loud. But here we are broadcasting it. <laughs> everyone, everyone knows. Don't tell anybody. Um, I was tried to, I, there's so many funny stories from New York with you, but the best one I could think of was when we were on the subway. Um, the first, like, it was like your second day in New York City. And do you want to tell the story? Oh, man. I, I'm guessing I know which story you're talking about. The one where I... so epic. Yes, yes. Lost. Yes. Well, when we were serving, our goal was to talk to as many people as possible, like no matter where you were. And so you'd get on the subway and you'd find an empty seat next to someone and start talking to them. Um, but one of the rules is you're not supposed to leave your companion. Um, we only had one cell phone between the two of us, too, and she had it. So we <laughs> were actually there with some other missionaries. I don't remember what we were doing, but um, and I was sitting down and doing my du duty and talking to this person next to me. And I was obviously doing a really good job because I was so focused. <laughs> so focused. Notice, not just Lindsay, but a group of missionaries getting off of the train. And then I kept talking. And I, the doors closed and I noticed it got quieter. So I turned and I looked out the window and I saw <laughs> Lindsay on the other side going, ah, 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 like literally jumping up and down, trying to get my attention. And I just turned to the person and I was like, I think I was supposed to get off there. And I don't think we've had a conversation about like what to do in this situation, but yeah. I got off. Um, or maybe you were like, get off. You were miming something to me. Yeah. So I got off on the next the next spot or whatever and luckily there was a miracle and somebody there their phone worked on the ground and i called her and it was like mom help <laughs> so, oh, she said, oh. she, we reunited it we did out. we Eventually. did i was so terrified i'm like it's like her first day in new york city and i just lost her oh my gosh like uh, <laughs> so I good know. i was gonna i had a picture I was gonna show. Let's see if I can get it to work. I don't even know how to make this work, but let's see. Can, oh, it's terrible. Oh man, that's awesome. It was. <laughs> can, can you tell? That is a frozen fire hydrant. 
the water came out that is pure ice and we obviously look really really oh, good we used to wear those like huge hats it was really attractive oh my god <laughs> Okay, it's like bad and then really bad with the glare, so I'll have to get some physical copies next time. Okay. Uh, well, awesome. Thank you, Caitlin. All right, Janny. So Janny and I met as well freshman year in the dorms, and I, it was our sophomore year. We were roommates and, again, and um, I just want to tell, I think it'd be fun if you told the story in the library where we were trying to film a music video. Of course we were trying to film a music video um, and uh, just for fun. And we went to the library into the back of the library to like film as part of it. And Jan, you want to? I don't even remember. I just, I just remember that. Um, I don't remember why we were making it at all. Like, I think we might've just been making it. But it was Britney Spears, wasn't it? Britney Spears. Yes. I don't remember what song, but for some reason in one of the scenes, I was supposed to do a backflip. Because why not? <laughs> in between like an aisle that's like of two books that are like really narrow. And so I don't know if I was trying to do a standing backflip or like, I can't remember. I think I was. Anyways, long story short, I did not make it all the way around, and I got the wind knocked out of me, and I could barely breathe, and it was very destructive to the learning environment of the library. Um, you landed on your head. I landed on my head, and I could not breathe. Yeah, I, I like, was panicking, because we're in the middle of the quiet library, she's just like, poof, she lands on her head, she's not breathing, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, I can't. All for a Britney Spears music video for who knows what reason. Anyways, <laughs> classic Lindsay and Janney. Um, so, and then last but not least, we've got Whitney here. A lot of you, or some of you may remember, if you've been um, following me for a long time, Whitney was with me on my first few tours. She did merch for me on the road. And so, um, I don't know, Whitney, do you want to tell a little bit about that experience? Maybe. I think Whitney's frozen. Oh no. Okay, we might come back to Whitney, Look but- Look how cute she is though. She, she I know. Is, she's, a, she's frozen a very <laughs> flattering position. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible when you got the bad freeze, especially when you can see it and you're like, oh no, oh no. Yeah, like, stop, stop. Yeah, I don't look like that. <laughs> yeah, or do I? Um, okay, well, welcome everybody. Those are, these are my beautiful friends and um, I'm excited that we're gonna be having this conversation about this book because this, the reason that I chose this book is because one, it's my favorite book. Um, it's, I feel like it kind of was a life-changing process for me to read this book. And this is the book that inspired my entire album, Brave Enough. And I'll go more into that maybe later, but um, Janny actually introduced me to the book because I was just talking to her and telling her I was so scared to write another album and I didn't know if I could do it. And I was afraid I was going to fail and like that this fear was crippling me. And Janny was like, you should read Daring Greatly. Like, I think that's what you need right now. And I did, and it gave me the courage to not only write the album, but it inspired all the concepts of that album. So anyways. I get inspired by very different things. So first of all, I want to read um, or have somebody read the very first quote of the book, which is kind of the premise for what the book is about. Does anybody want to read it? Wait, which part are you? Um, is it the critic? It's not the critic who counts. It's pretty good. I actually have it on the wall over here. Really? I got it printed. This is my husband's office, and I thought he could... Yeah. He needs he needs it more than I do. Just kidding. He needs it. He's totally <laughs> listening, so he's gonna be like, "What? What the heck?" <laughs> um, Janny, Caitlin, are you gonna read it? Oh, I can read yeah, it. Yeah, Janny, go for it. All right. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, who whose faith is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasm, the great devotion, 
who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end of triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails love him, daring greatly. Oh, I love that. I really feel like I could have a whole discussion just on that paragraph or those several paragraphs alone. Um, but just like, this is my favorite quote of all time. I've put it into my shows even, like sometimes my shows have been introed by this quote or like in the middle, like I'll do a costume change while this quote is being read because I just love it so much. Um, but I wanna get into a discussion, like he talks about like the bravery to stand even if you know you might fail. And so I just wanted to kind of pose the question, how does the word failure make you feel? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a sound. And I love that. <laughs> it's uncomfortable. It's shrinking. Yes. Gary. Yeah. I like it's something that you try to avoid. It's not not it, something you seek for. It almost feels like failure is a, is attached not only to an it, like a moment or an incident or a thing. It feels like it's attached to like your worth in a way like a failure it's almost like you can't help but wear that on your actual self i, f I feel like um if you fail at something but um the actual de like think about it what's the actual definition of what it means like what is a failure like if you just define it it's to be unsuccessful in achieving one's goal like that's all like you failed to make it to the supermarket today. Like that was, you know. And so if you take the like emotional response out of the word failure, you realize it's just the that you didn't complete what you set out to do. And it then doesn't have the same weight as like attaching itself to my, you know, to myself. Anyways, I thought that was interesting to kind of dissect those two world wor words. Um, and I love, oh, go on. I was just going to say, and I think it's so important to note that anytime you attach anything, like we've talked a lot about this in general, anytime you attach anything to your identity besides your innate worth, it can be stripped from you. Mm. And so even like with the word failure, like if that becomes a part of who you are, then you've already stripped yourself of that innate worth, which is because you are, you are valued and loved and cherished. And so it's interesting how we do that so often is we attach ourselves with these meanings and mm -hmm. so it makes sense why it would be so scary um why failure would be so scary especially if we attach to innately who we think we are yes i love that and you've brought that up multiple times that like anytime you say i am you know i love that like i am you know depressed or i am like you know like anything with the term i am like you're attaching it to your what did you say just your innate worth. I mean, really, it's I am it should just be because you are. Like, and yeah. because of that, you have value and worth. Yeah. So when we touch tangible or temporary labels, even it become it it can take so much from us. Absolutely. Especially when they're changed. Like for me, like if I attached like recently, you know, I left my job. If I attached so much of my worth to that career, as soon as it would pull away, what am I? Right. And we do it all. We do it all the time, though. We do it all the time. We we attach things to us, and I think failure is a huge one. Absolutely. Um, I love this quote that's on page fifteen. She says, "When failure is not an option, we can forget about learning, creativity, and innovation." And I just loved that so much because, like, and you hear that all the time that failure is not an option. But it's like, but when that happens, like. If failure hadn't been an option for me, you better believe I would not have set out on a career to be a dancing violinist playing electronic music. Like, you know, I, I went for it believing that I could do it. But if I if that was like, I cannot fail, um, you know, I don't think I would have had the courage to face it if failure wasn't an option. Like, because when you're being, cre anyways, what do you guys, any thoughts on that? Well, and the fact that you even, sorry, I've got to be quiet, but the fact that you even had a belief that you could achieve it, like you never once questioned the fact that you could do what you wanted to do. Like from, I just remember when I first met you, you would always say, I'm going to travel the world and pay for it by playing my violin. <laughs> like that was like your mantra and you said it all the time, mm. but it took, like you said, a, 
a lot of failure in, in, in beautiful ways. Some not so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so beautiful. And some people were really mean. <laughs> Oh, no, that's true. It's um, and that's why I just love this quote so much. I feel like it embodies a lot of my journey of, and everybody's journey of just the amount of times that you have to sometimes fail in order to, um, you know, reach any attainable goal. And so, you know, she talks a lot in her books about vulnerability. And so what price are we paying if we aren't, or sorry. <laughs> so what price are we paying if we won't allow ourselves to be vulnerable? I think to me it's I mean you're paying the price of not growing not progressing not getting to where you could get you know mm -hmm. and this when I was reading this book it's just um I have a little daughter and she's very little and the more I see kids I realize that failure to them at uh, the littler they are it doesn't really matter they just try and try and then they get up and I've try to think why that happens and I think it's because to them if you think about it we connect failure to what other people see from us right we don't want to fail because then people see us in a vulnerable place mm -hmm. but for kids they don't care about what people think they don't care if they fail they don't care you know and so they just keep trying and trying and that's why they all of a sudden they can walk and they can run and they can achieve so much development during that time. Because imagine if, if kids were afraid of failure, they would never learn to walk or to yeah. jump, you know. And um, I think as adults, we need to remember and try to think that way where it's like, you know what, failure, I'm only seeing it through the eyes of someone else. If I forget about that, I can try whatever I want and I might fail, but I can try again and I can try something else. So I think, yeah, you just lose that progress that you could have in your life if you are not vulnerable. Absolutely. That's so well said. And um, yeah, I love the analogy to like a child, you know, and how brave they are. <clears throat> Um, and what exactly, I guess we didn't even talk about like, what exactly is vulnerability? Like, what does it mean to, to you? I know Lynn's I wrote, it's so interesting because how I came across Brene Brown in this and just shame and vulnerability was actually a pretty profound way, but I won't share it right now. But it's interesting because I wrote like, what is vulnerability? And as I was thinking about it, I actually drew it on two ends. I don't know if you can see. So like here is vulnerability and the, here I have fear and here I have joy. Mm. And so I realized that I experience on two opposite extremes of each other. Like I feel extremely vulnerable when I have really joyous and almost like sacred life experiences that are so personal to me that I feel a vulnerability there. And then I fear I, I experience it oftentimes on the opposite extreme where there's a lot of fear or unknown and worry. Both the two spectrums where I oftentimes feel it. But when I'm allowed to be truly vulnerable, especially in those two places, that's where you develop this deep connection with one another. And that's where you like, like, for example, with you guys, like I know that I can 100% be myself and, and be vulnerable with you guys. And because of that, um, that connection is strengthened and it feels so whole and beautiful. <clears throat> where it's like with, when I'm not willing to be vulnerable and I might have, a, you know, kind of like a wall or, or um, afraid to be really me, then that relationship doesn't quite mean as much because in my mind I think, but they don't really know the real me. Mm -hmm. And so they can't possibly think that about me or this about me or, you know, or actually truly want to connect with me because they don't really know me. And so we, we lose out on so, on so uh, much love, connection, and friendship, and value when we're not willing to, to pay the price of vulnerability. But it is so scary. It is so scary. Absolutely. And so I feel like there's, oh my gosh, I'm going to apologize now, you guys. My husband's out of town. My kids are crazy. <laughs> so, oh, here it goes. Um, anyways, I, I feel like there's a high level of authenticity connected to vulnerability um you know when you're brave enough to be your true self and not like show I don't know I've been talking to a friend recently about like 
the well even you guys we've talked about it recently too about filters on instagram and everything is so filtered now and how that literally is putting barriers between you know our genuine selves and other people and um and why are we doing it it's because we're scared to show the bags under our eyes or whatever it is and you know that is I don't know, you're not being authentic if you're not being vulnerable in a lot of ways. Absolutely. Somebody, like there's a couple comments too, like kind of along the same lines of what we're talking about. Someone says, let's see, PTA Sterlingite says, being vulnerable demonstrates love and acceptance. Um, it says it's a sign of trusting family and friends. Um, someone was asking, what book are we talking about? We're talking about Daring Greatly. And Brene Brown definitely describes vulnerability in here in like very technical terms. But I think it's interesting to like listen to each other talk about it because someone was saying she describes it in the book. But I love it that vulnerability will mean something different to every single person. And <clears throat> I find that uh, the more vulnerable you can be, I think it's just not only letting other people in, it's like a sign that you're accepting yourself. Um, that you're taking yeah. down these walls um, and that you're okay with where you're at. Cause I feel like sometimes the most vulnerable thing to me is like, I feel like so much of my worth gets wrapped up in what I do, my work, who I am as an artist, like getting that kind of feedback. It's like, it's created this false sense of self-esteem. And so when that's taken away, um, whew, I'm so depleted sometimes because I have to be okay with just the just the Lindsay that I'm that I'm left with, which is everything, which is the most important thing. But that's the rawness that I'm like, am I enough just being me? Um, and you you guys have talked. Oh, sorry. Go on. I, I like this comment from Prism Sterling. Being vulnerable is opening yourself up to the world. Sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't, mm. you know, like being Ooh, open like to that. the possibility of good and bad from taking chances and putting yourself out there. Right, well, and that's the whole title of the book, Daring Greatly. Like, it's, it takes a lot of courage to dare greatly, to like put yourself out there, but anything worth having, you know, you have to accept that um, it might work out, it might not this time. And so, you know, I, I love that. <clears throat> I think one thing too that people confuse oftentimes vulnerability with is telling the deepest, darkest secrets to everyone. And one thing that I've realized is that your story is sacred and unique to you and you don't owe it to anybody, right? Like you can choose um, who you share that personal story with, but being authentic <laughs> and being um, being um, willing to, you know, like we said, dare greatly means showing up and being seen, even if it's scary, not knowing what the risk might be um, <clears throat> and being authentic. But again, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go and tell everybody like your biggest secret, right? Because I think so many people think that like, if I don't share this, then they, you know, that that's not me being um, vulnerable or authentic. It's like, well, not everybody deserves your story. Right. Like, not everyone right. has the right to that. That's a sacred thing that um, you get to determine who you feel safe with in order to share that with. Right, it's not The Bachelor where on the first date you tell them all <laughs> of your dark secrets and, you know, things that you would never tell a stranger. Like, like anyway, sorry. It's not The Bachelor. Um, thank you, Jenny, for making that distinction because that is a real thing of like, I feel like sometimes there's that line between uh, people are oversharing nowadays and sharing things on social media and broadcasting these things that are very personal, you know, so I think it's important to like, why am I sharing this? Is it to get attention? Is it to be authentic? Is it, you know, like, why am I doing this is a really important question. I think I ask myself when I'm trying to be vulnerable because I'm sure sometimes I have maybe overshared. Um, it's a hard line to draw, but you know, that's part of the process is learning where that line is. Um, and Caitlin, you talked a little bit about um, like the internet and the way that that has like, you know, created, like it's just made all of this a lot more complicated. The internet's done some amazing things, but um, I feel like our world is more connected than it's ever been. However, people have never been more disconnected. Um, why, why do you think that is? Any thoughts I mean on that? Yeah, a lot of it's just due to our um, shame prone, our sh and Brene Brown talks about this, but our shame prone culture that we have. Yes. Um, and 
it's so it we we're so we so desperately want connection and and it's an and it's a need that we all have that sometimes um and we all crave it um but in our shame prone culture oftentimes we when we allow ourselves to be seen then sh the shame culture comes in and starts you know, I, I identifying you with all sorts of these unwanted identities that you have that you don't want to associate with. And I think Caitlin talked about that. Like, um, they start throwing these out to you and then that creates shame and then shame causes us to run and hide because we don't want to be seen that way and so we run and hide and then all of a sudden, why do we feel shame? It's what is shame? It's the fear of disconnection. And so we're afraid to be seen because there's so much shame and then shame causes us to disconnect more with each other. It's just like this vicious cycle that goes around and around and around. Yeah. Well, and I think yeah. it's, interest it's, in it's interesting what you said about connection because on, on page eight, it actually talks about connection. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna read a little bit of it. It says, connection is why we're here. We are hardwired to connect with others. It's what gives us purpose and meaning to our lives and without it there is suffering mm -hmm. and what makes me think about it is we are like very connected right I mean technology has provided that way to be connected but are we connecting in the right ways or are we using technology the wrong way uh, with you know trying to be someone that maybe we're not are we being authentic in our connections <clears throat> and yeah so it is interesting that the connection can sometimes also hurt when we don't use it the right way yes I, I love that. It's like, are we using it the right way? And one thing I thought of was that uh, I feel like love and connection in terms of how we use technology, like this connection idea is actually replaced or confused with praise and admiration. Like we're not a lot of times, you know, going on the internet 100% to like really authentically connect to people. A lot of times, you know, we all get sucked into this thing of, you know, all the all the different statistics and analytics and the likes and the comments and, you know, praise. And I it's, I think it would be so hard to grow up with all of this like TikTok stuff and, you know, how that would mess with the way you see connection and value. And, um, you know, and I do love what you said about like that is what gives purpose and meaning to our lives. Like connection is everything. Having true vulnerable authentic connections with people that is the greatest thing that could ever give us fulfillment and happiness yeah I think, yeah oh go ahead Caitlin Please. well I'm just thinking of like I remember one time in the past I was like looking at my friends number of friends I had on Facebook when Facebook was still cool I mean I don't think it's as I cool think as it used to be cool yeah <laughs> I'm old. where's my part I think it's uh, it's kind of it's getting closer to the middle um, but it's like, I remember being like, whoa, I can't believe how many had, or I, I compared it to my husband's who had like way less than I did. And I was like, Haha, you know, kind of just teasing him about it. And then he was like, how many of those people do you still talk to? Like, do you know their first and last names? Like, what do you know about these people? And I was like, hey. you know, like I had, I had shallow relationships with a lot of people, which yeah i don't i don't want you know like i wouldn't i don't want that for me like do you even know my name like who i guess you can read my name on here but um like the opposite is having deep relationships with the small number of people because you I mean it takes it might take the same amount of time but it has more it allows for more of a deeper connection um and so i don't know I, when you get past like the number and think of them as human beings and what you can do like how deep oh my gosh she's just opening and shutting the door that girl <laughs> when you think about it anything that is beautiful at least in my life i think about like anything that is really cher like that i cherish and love and that is beautiful oftentimes involves connection with something and that can even, I mean, it can be nature, it can be friends, it can be family, like, and connection is just such a needed, it's so needed, and we are moving away from it. Like, people are, I mean, think about right now, think about how disconnected it's just because of it, how everything is in our world. Like, we have people just craving connection right now, and we can provide safe ways for that to happen, but it's, it's an innate need. Like, it is, like, 
Vivian read, we are hardwired for connection. It's why we're here. It gives us purpose and meaning. Absolutely. And, you know, this this might be a little off the beaten path, but years ago I went to like, like not a psychic, but like a spiritual reader medium. And I like kind of believe in that stuff. I kind of don't. It's like food for thought for me. So anyways, with a grain of salt is how I always take those kind of experiences. It's like, it's fun, but I, uh. so she told me in my reading, she goes, wow, you were sent to this world to love. She's like, that's your greatest mission is to love people. Like she's like, and I don't even mean romantic love. She says, you know, like loving humanity. And, you know, I loved that. And I really thought to myself, that's not my mission. That's everyone's mission. And like, how does that make you feel when you think about the fact that, like if someone said that to you, wow, Caitlin, you were sent to love. That's what your soul, per which I truly believe about Caitlin. Um, but you were sent to this earth to be kind and loving and, you know, wrap people up in the aura of like your love. Like that makes us all sound so magical. And I honestly believe with all my heart that that is a message that was meant like that everybody can be um, related to. You know, we were sent here to connect. We were sent here to love. And so don't forget that. Um, and I would love, I think, oh, go ahead, Whit, sorry. <laughs> I've had some computer issues, but hopefully you can hear me now. I'm on my phone. Um, but I think going along with that, or that you can, the more vulnerable you are, the more you're able to love. Um, and I, I actually kind of, it reminded me of a experience I had with you guys when we were roommates, actually. Um, I remember it was kind of hard for me to be vulnerable and connect. Obviously, it still is. But I, I was kind of always the one that was, um, you know, I stayed in the apartment, didn't, I never went out dancing with Vivian and Lindsay. Maybe, but um, I remember like, keeping a lot of things to myself and um, I had some like issues with food and eating disorders at the time. And I always thought like, oh, I can't share this with anybody because, you know, Lindsay and Jenny, they're so healthy and like, you know, they're going to think I'm lame or whatever. Um, but then years later, as our relationship, you know, got stronger we kind of shared with each other like different things that we struggled with. And we realized that while we were roommates, we all struggled with those same things. Um, and I think just sharing that and being open with each other brought us so much closer together. And I mean, just that's how it always is. And so the, and then it gives you the ability to love more when you are able to connect and open up to people um, and really get to know them. So. Anyway, I wanted to share that experience that I had. I guys. love that story. And I that was such a profound moment for me when we were all talking and like realized, oh my gosh, we all had, you know, like a lot of us had the we same problem. Realized. And I wish we had worked together. And somebody in the comments said, that is something my therapist was saying, that the more vulnerable we are in a safe environment, the more authentic connections we can make. And, um, you know, a lot of like mental illnesses, you know, like depression, anxiety, anorexia, they thrive in an environment of secrecy. They thrive when they are kept to yourself because you feel like you cannot share it. And so like, I cannot say enough of just encouraging, mm -hmm. find a safe environment, whether it's a therapist, whether it's like at the time, my safe environment was my therapist and my mom. They were the people I talked to about it. And I don't know how I would have gotten it, gotten through it, without them i wish i had made my community just a little bit bigger um but anyways that's just something i want to share that they thrive in secrecy Lindsay, can i but, share how i came across like shame in general yeah please because um, it i think it like it did it completely altered my life so i had been working at a rape crisis center right after college and i so my job was I ran a rape crisis team, and so when a rape would take place in a, in a city, I would show up at the rape. I would show up with the rape victim and be there for that person. So anyways, but part of that is I also taught these education classes for these women. And I would sit there with these phenomenal humans. And, um, 
and I would hear them just talk so bad about who they were. And it like killed me because I didn't understand how they could see themselves in certain light, but this, but um, their experience had taken so much from them. And, and I realized that what they were experiencing was shame, that run and hide, like something has happened to me. And I didn't understand shame at all. Like I couldn't understand it. I remember like, I'm going to tackle this. So I have a brother who's a psychologist. I remember calling him and saying, send me articles, anything you can about shame. And I was sitting in my office one day and I remember that a girl, um, and I totally even remember who it was, but she came into my office and she said to me, have you seen this new TED talk that was just recently put out by Brene Brown? And it was right when it went live, like this, so the very beginning of when she was around. And um, I watched it and I thought, oh my gosh, like this, this truly is the answer. And so one of the things that clicked for me is that, um, here these women are, they were experiencing this, this deep shame. And they were oftentimes saying like the rapes were my fault. Like some of them had this thought process, um, because I made myself available or I did that or I did that. And one of the things that we came down to is that they were vulnerable, right? But we all have to be vulnerable in situations when connection, when we want to make connection. And so it took a flip that somebody wronged your vulnerability. Like somebody took advantage of your vulnerability in the worst of ways, and it was not your fault. And then as we as a group started talking about it, and, and they started communicating with one another and saying, well, this happened to you, and I think you're phenomenal, and this happened to you, and I think you're phenomenal, maybe I'm not so bad myself. And that is what dispelling shame does. When we're authentic and we're vulnerable, and we share, for example, an experience or like a post, like I know recently, Caitlin, you shared a post, I don't know, probably I think around November, a vulnerable, a vulnerable moment. So many people were like, thank you. Yes, me too. And all of a sudden, all these people started being able to relate and coming up because like, you were seeing what I was feeling, but I was so scared to say it myself. And so it creates, to me, that totally changed my life. That speaking, speaking our shame, even when we're scared, allows other people to do it, and it dispels the darkness. It brings us to the light, right? It, it pushes it away. And that, to me, has totally altered my life, honestly. Now, that is so good. I thank you for sharing that. And I think that really, like, had a light bulb go on for me that it's um, even more so than, like, maybe the mental illness thriving in secrecy, which it does. But shame, you're right. It's shame that thrives in secrecy. And, you know, so uh, anyways, you said it so well. Thank you. Um, I want to, unless anyone has something else in to discuss in this part, I want to move on to uh, wholehearted living. Okay, let's go for it. All right, so page nine, she, des she describes um, wholehearted living, um, which is basically, you know, what she talks about a ton in this book. It's like kind of the way we will live our best full life, you know, and loving ourselves. And she says, wholeheartedness is a way of engaging with the world from a place of worthiness. A way of engaging with the world from a place of worthiness. I just thought that was so good. Um, and so um, it's like, what well, if we all like honestly believed we were worthy, I think we would, like the world would be a really different place. And so, I don't know, I thought there's a list here of all the things that we would need, you know, that we should work on letting go of in order to... Um, what page are you on, Linz? Page nine, sorry. Page nine, there's this list of all the things. Should we read this list? Yeah. Um, does someone want to read the list? Yes. And as we read this list, just think about like, oh my gosh, like <laughs> all the things that like maybe personally we need to work on. Uh, Caitlin, can you read it? Yeah, I'm sorry. Ella's in here, so oh. be warned. Okay. Um, <laughs> cultivating well, authenticity. Is, can you hear? Uh, maybe let's have Vivian read it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. All right, we'll start with cultivating authenticity, letting go of what people think, cultivating self-compassion, letting go of perfectionism, Cultivating a res resilient spirit, letting go of numbing and powerlessness. 
cultivating gratitude and joy, letting go of scarcity and fear of the dark, cultivating intuition and trusting faith, letting go of the need of certainty, cultivating creativity, letting go of comparison, cultivating play and rest, letting go of exhaustion as a status symbol and productivity as self-worth, cultivating calm and stillness, letting go of anxiety as a lifestyle, cultivating meaningful work, letting go of self-doubt and supposed to. And the last one, cultivating laughter, song, and dance, <laughs> letting go of being cool and always in control. Oh, I don't know about you guys, but when like I read through that list, it's almost like, ugh, ugh, oh gosh, oh gosh, like so many <laughs> yeah. things that I'm like, oh my gosh, like I need to work on and it can feel really overwhelming. But just like think for a second, like how would our life, how would my life, your life be different if like we could let go of all these things, perfectionism, what others think, numbing, um, all these, like there's so many things, letting go of exhaustion as a status symbol. Like, um, so what are ways that we can learn to be wholehearted? Because these are very like tactical, like, um, I don't know, they're very specific, but in our actual lives, like what are ways that we can work on being wholehearted? Um, it talks a lot in page 10 and 11 about the different, like some things we can do, but. I mean, I just think of like little, like um, Vivian said, like little kids, like they're such a good example of wholehearted living. Like they feel to the, to the umph degree, like I, I, some of the sweetest things of wholehearted living that I see in my home, I have five little kids, is just like little glimpses of just joy. Like, and trust me, it's pure chaos most of the time. But like, for example, when I walk into a room and I see my kids hanging their monkeys upside down, um, and when I see them just not worry, um, you know, necessarily what others think, others think and they're just dancing and they're just um, experiencing joy, to me that that is wholehearted living and um, and so for me i i i can i learn a lot from my kids um now of course like there are things that i have in my personality have pushed on to them so they don't do as much like for example um not trying to show them that productivity isn't a, isn't a sign of worth it's just because you are like there are things that i've pushed on and and have to back out on but um yeah, I think kids do such a good job at this. Little kids are such so good at it. No, it really is it. true. <laughs> and <clears throat> I mean, I just oftentimes think like, if you want to try to see your own self worth, like see yourself as a child. Like imagine yourself as a little kid, like with that energy you had and with that self love. Like you can't look at a little kid and think like they're dumb and like not productive and you know like but just like see yourself in the loving eyes of as if you were looking at the child version of yourself and that's a really good way to like I mean children always are just I, I feel like they just understand um I also uh really loved that um well someone in the comments said that um oh what did they say they just said like doing little things every day because we were talking about how it sometimes is so overwhelming to like see this huge list of things to let go of and not be and so they said like just little things every day um i don't know where the comment went but thank you for that and i think you know you can break this down into like very um you know very actual practical things and one thing she actually says is um to think to yourself in the morning when you wake up no matter what gets done and how much is left undone, I am enough. Like this idea, yeah. and it's just something you can say to yourself. Um, you know, also, like I said, visualizing yourself as if you did believe that you were enough. Like, what would you feel like? And I'm a big believer in visualization. Um, you know, see yourself looking through the eyes of like, I am enough. I, you know, I, I know I'm amazing. Like, whatever it is, all those things that you're trying to let go of. Um, but, um, you know, and a thought I had is that I really think if you're really hard on yourself, like all these things that we're trying to let go of, all that judgment and self-doubt, um, it makes it a lot easier to be really hard on other people. 
you know, um, it's a lot harder to be patient with other people if you're really unkind and pa impatient to yourself. Um, hold on, sorry, my doorbell's ringing. Ah, uh, by no, the I love. Oh, go ahead. Lynn. No, please keep go. No, I was just gonna say I love what you said, like engaging in our lives from a place of worthiness. I am enough. Like if every, think about how different our world would be if everyone treated each other and themselves from that place. Yeah. Like, oh, it would be so amazing because think about the kindness that would be shared and the innovation and the creativity and all of those things because we would be looking through a lens of worth versus like, again, Brene Brown talks about this lens of scarcity, like that I'm never enough and things are not enough. Um, right. That's, be what so of, that's what a lot of people are saying in the comments too, that we are our worst enemy and our worst critic, you know? And if you think of it that way, I, I feel like you have to come with a sense of love for yourself and give you the benefit of the doubt. And I, I, I am uh, an example of that. Like it says in the book, a lot of times like we go to bed thinking, oh, I didn't get this done and this and this and this. And then you wake up thinking, oh, I didn't get enough sleep. And I, you know, like we live in this little world that we've come to ourselves where it's like, I'm just not enough. I'm never enough. And how sad is that, you know? Absolutely. Like, um, I, and I think that's, uh, I had a thought come to me of an experience I had that ties into what you guys are talking about. Um, especially this idea of seeing not only yourself through the lens of like wholehearted living, but others. Um, I was at this event where um, Justin Baldoni, it, I don't know if you guys know who he is, but he's an actor and he puts on this amazing charity event every year for his birthday party. And it is a carnival on Skid Row for the homeless. And they have volunteers come and like we, we brought tons of clothing for them. There was like, there were games, there was food. And what they did um, was they paired up the volunteers with a homeless person and you would take them through the entire experience. And a big part of the point of it is to like, have people treat people just like people. Everybody's enough. And it was like one of the most moving experiences I've ever been a part of. It felt like utopia where it didn't matter who had, um, you know, it didn't matter how much money this person had or what their status was or what they were wearing or um, what their mental capacity was. You, w with your person you're, that you got paired with and you just talked, we just talked and you'd see people all dancing together of different everything. And it just felt so beautiful to like, truly look at people and see them just as people and it was like you know it kind of when that layer is stripped away you realize how many filters we put on our perspective of everybody that we engage with like all the time um someone, someone just commented a quote that i think is so nice it says if the only birds that sang were the best then the woods would be silent indeed oh Sweet. I, I love that, that. thank you for yeah. sharing that um, oh, I love that. I've never heard that. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. There's also, um, you know, uh, let's see. Where do we want to go from here? Um, they're on page 11. They're the second bullet point, number two. Um, there was a really important point that was brought up in here about wholehearted living. Like the difference between people who do like, well, anyways, does someone want to like paraphrase that? Janny, go for it. Yeah, so this is something that I've been thinking a lot, but it says those who, okay, so it's talking in general about um, people who necessarily um, feel worthy of love and belonging. Why do some people feel like that and others don't? And it says um, those who feel lovable, who love and who experience belonging simply believe they are worthy of love and belonging. That's it. And uh, when I... I mean, this is something that I've seen a lot. So I work in the, well, I've been in the space of social work. Um, but anyways, seeing people that have gone through really traumatic experiences oftentimes are stripped of this and they no longer believe that they're worthy of love and belonging. And there's a, there's a quote that says, it takes people to break people and it takes people to heal people. And to me, this is, why this is so crucial that I think all of our journeys 
are to help people simply believe that they're worthy of love and belonging. Yeah. Um, like when we, sorry, this, like when we were at um, the beach that day and we had, you know, that homeless woman came and she was interrupting dinner. Um, it Obviously it affected me greatly as you guys saw. But as I turned around and I saw her, she was screaming at us. And I just looked into her eyes. I just thought, oh my gosh, like you are so worthy of kindness and love. And I I didn't do it, but the thought in my mind came was to ask her her name, just to ask her her name and remind her that you have value and you worth and and just ask her her name. And I didn't do it. I got, I was afraid and it's haunted me ever since because it's so easy to put people in the other category. Oh, that's not me. They're, They're the other. But it is so true that everyone is worthy of love and belonging. And it, it, those that think it are simply those that believe they are. And I think half of our, I think, like you guys said, like our mission and purpose is to help people feel that, that they are worthy of that. Mm, thank you. And the way you say that the thought to just ask her her name. And, you know, when I went to this, um, you know, this carnival on Skid Row, I've actually been a couple of years now, but it's made me like realize that before I think a lot of times I wouldn't look like a homeless person in the eye. You know, you almost, you feel uncomfortable around, you know, so you sometimes don't even look them in the eye because you're like, well, I don't have money in my purse, so I don't have anything to give them. You know, I'm not going to look at them. But it's like one of the most beautiful things you can do for anyone is to make them feel seen, like they are a human. And, you know, like, what is your name? Hi. Like, look them in the eye and smile. Treat people like people. Make them feel like they are worthy of love, you know, in all of our interactions. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, I also loved bullet three. Um, It says, a strong belief in our worthiness doesn't just happen. It is cultivated when we understand the guideposts and choices and daily practices. So, you know, I just think... There's a reason that this book has sold over 2 million copies and it's not just because it was like beautifully written, it's because a lot of people struggle with this. Like it's easy to read all this and be like, well, gosh, I'll, I can't do that. Like this isn't describing me. But the reason it sold 2 million copies is because very few of us like are at this point yet. Um, and it, as she says, a belief in worthiness doesn't just happen. It's cultivated. It's something that we can all learn so like no matter where each one of us is at in this journey of learning that we are worthy of love and that we're enough wherever you are on that spectrum like this is something that you can learn and that's i love that sorry i sorry my headphones went out and i was just staring at your beautiful faces for a while but well, now lu- i can hear you lucky again. you um, <laughs> um i think i love that uh, she points that out is that it's because when she describes these wholehearted people that she studied and like they had the it factor that made them you know have this it felt like they were just like oh these perfect people and um but really she points out that it's something that you have to continually work for Mm -hmm. and it's not like they have it you don't yes so sorry sucks to be you no that's not the case but also like those people are there because they are making a conscious effort to be that way. And I feel like anytime I, I have a hard time with, I don't know what you like self-help books. Cause I read them and I'm like, well, this isn't going to work for me. Cause I don't have that capacity most of the time, but like little steps doing things, small things to change how you look at yourself, how you look at others that will make an impact. And also like, it's a progress it's not there's not like an end goal where you're going to be done and for me that makes it easier to make the journey when i'm not expecting to be like i can't get to that point because there's no point does that make sense like it's process and it will always be a process and you will find new ways that you need to you know develop yourself and be more vulnerable or whatever um and i love that it's work you know you just have to keep working at it and it that's why it's possible because for anyone because anyone has that capacity that yeah sound like i was sending 
capacity. I that okay. <laughs> um, no, that is so true. And one thing I was thinking a little bit about, like totally along the lines of what you're saying is, I think we've all been taught to put things into categories of like good and bad. Like I'm either good or I'm bad or like I get it or I don't or I'm, you know, I'm smart or I'm dumb. Like, you know, and I remember even in, in regards to like being anorexic, food became this is good food, this is safe food, this is all bad food. And like that was one of the first things my therapist talked to me about was like you have to separate or take the separation out of that. Like it's all food, you know, and like take the separation out of like, I can't be this. Like, I, I'll never get there. Like, either you are born with authenticity or you're not, or you're born happy or you're not. Like, like take out these extremes and realize that it's like a spectrum and we're all somewhere along it, like just trying to get better. And use that to, as to give grace to other people mm. who are on that as well. You know, this, the woman we saw at dinner, the, you know, everyone, it makes it easier to see people as people when you realize that they're part of they're learning themselves they're part of this you know line of progression and it's easier to have grace or compassion for those around us when we recognize we are all on the same journey <laughs> we're all trying to figure this out and you know we have to give space to each other to allow us to have moments of failures and moments of joy and embrace both of those with the knowledge that okay this is part of the process absolutely well I think too like um and we didn't it didn't talk ton about this yet but like she gets into empathy I can't even remember what book she gets into it but I think empathy um in a class that I taught I, we would always talk about this girl who was running away from a group home and she was running in like a canal and there were broken glass and she's running from this group home and her counselors, which Lindsay, you can probably relate and I can relate. We both work in these places and they're running from you. And anyway, so this girl is running and she's icing up her feet and all the glass. And what caused her to stop is she turned around and she saw that her counselor had taken off the shoes and was running after her and also cutting his feet and it's an extreme it's extreme analogy but it was I mean this actually was a true story but because he was willing to put himself in her shoes and her pain as she saw it not as he saw it um he was able to experience empathy for her and we need that for others and for ourselves like what Caitlin was talking about that compassion that grace that's empathy it's willing to see like if Lindsay or Vivian or Whitney or Keelan, you guys have a bad day. It's me sitting there and saying, I want to see that bad day through, th through their lens and how they're experiencing it, not through my lens. Right. Because in my, maybe in my lens, I thought, Oh my gosh, that's not a big deal. Like Ella pooped on the ground. My twins smeared poop all over the walls and then dumped a gallon of milk, whatever. You know what I mean? It's so easy to start going down the compare chain, but if we actually, practice empathy seeing things as they see it not as we see it and um, that's when we allow that grace that's when we allow that progress that's when we allow ourselves to be kind to one another um it's such a huge skill and it's the skill that we have to practice it doesn't come naturally i suck at it on a daily so oh whatever. i don't believe that for a second <laughs> no it is completely <laughs> i um i had a a thought about, um, you know, this wholehearted living idea, the idea that, you know, you really truly believe that you are worthy of love. Um, I think it makes it possible for us to be kinder to other people because we stop worrying about ourselves. We can go somewhere and we can actually put our energy into seeing other people and being empathetic rather than like, it takes so much energy to worry about yourself. And it's an interesting thought that like when you, like I think we would all be so much happier and we'd probably all have way more friends. <laughs> and, you know, even if, even if you just wanted to be popular, you'd probably be way more popular if you focus on what you saw in others rather than focusing on what others see in you. Like switch the focus. I think it would make us so much more at peace, you know, and it comes from accepting yourself. That's how you get there. Um, but Whitney, actually, I wanna put you on the spot and have you share a story um, 
because you shared this with us on Marco Polo a long time ago, and it was like a story about Valentine's Day. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> um, I was thinking about that. Yeah. So. Hmm. Poor oh, no. internet. I know. Frozen. When I was little, recognize that cons are feeling bad for yourself but you step there's that's what this is like something i learned you can't hear me sorry we can't hear you <laughs> oh dang it yeah maybe talk with your video off with when she comes oh. back maybe we'll have her do that because it's a really sweet story can you hear me now yeah yes. so talk with your video off okay i went um through my phone Ah, I thought I was on that. Okay, can you still hear me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so I learned this lesson in high school. Um, I remember this so clearly because I learned this um, this day. It was Valentine's Day, and I'm sure a lot of people's high school did this where you, they are like Valentine grams, and you can send a flower to somebody or um, balloons. We had balloons and flowers at my school, and so you could like write a note to your Valentine and um and then the spos would go and deliver them so we were in class and the spos come in with all these flowers and all these balloons and of course all the popular girls are getting um balloons and flowers and some girls getting like five <laughs> and i remember just feeling like oh my gosh i'm such a loser here i am like i didn't get anything and um everyone can see that i didn't get anything and so here i am in my own little like pity party and then I looked around and I'm like, I'm focusing on all these popular girls who have like 10, but like, I look around and I'm like, there's plenty of other kids in here that don't have any, you know? And so I, it like was a light bulb when I realized I'm not the only one that didn't get something. And so, um, during lunch that day, I went and I bought like a ton of balloons. They were only like 50 cents. I bought a ton of balloons and I sent them to people like who I knew probably wouldn't get one. And I remember sending it sending some to like all the special ed classes and like and then after that I felt so happy like the happiest I had felt in a long time and I remember sitting on the bus seeing the special ed class come out with all the balloons just like smiling and like laughing and just thinking of the other people that my friends you know who I sent them to made me so happy and from then on I promised myself I would always love Valentine's Day and I would never be depressed if I didn't have a boyfriend or didn't get a Valentine, but that I would always do something for others. And it was like one of the greatest lessons I ever learned. <laughs> that is such a sweet story. It like warms my heart so much. I remember when you told it, I was like, I like shared it with my Sunday school class that week. Like, <laughs> um, But it just is such a profound thing that I think we can all relate to. Um, so I, I next want to talk about... Um, scarcity uh that was chapter one so i feel like we've been mostly on the intro this whole time but the intro is kind of that there's a lot of meat in that intro so um but i do want to talk about scarcity because that is chapter one everybody thanks for hanging in there with us by the way everybody thank you for your comments um i love seeing like the things that you guys are writing like prism sterlingite if we stopped worrying about others perceptions of us we would be much happier world with less comparison and you know, just so many good comments in here. Um, and someone was saying they were really thankful for this. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, but uh, yeah, just thanks for being here today, everybody. For the book club. <laughs> Keep writing in your comments. I see them. We're watching. Uh, okay, so scarcity. The idea that there is never enough. Um, so why is scarcity so dangerous? Like a mindset of scarcity. Like an everyone for themselves thing, you know. Like you, if you want what you want, you have to rip it from somebody else. <laughs> you know, it almost feels like it's a a battle instead of I don't know. Like there's plenty for everyone. You know, you know when you go to like a potluck and the best dish, there's only a little <laughs> bit of it. You want to be at the front of the line to get the good stuff. Yeah, you're gonna. <laughs> end up with aunt myrtle's tuna surprise if you're not at the front 
so with the cat food in there. You want the good stuff. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, any other thoughts about that intro of scarcity? Um, I, yeah. What? That was a that was a perfect description. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Caitlin, you nailed it. We're moving on. We're done with chap <laughs> done with chapter oh, two. Um, I, I love how you describe it as like, um, it, it like almost aggressive, like scarcity makes it seem like you have to be aggressive in order to like make it. And to me, it also, the thought came to me that it's the idea that, um, there's only so much room at the top, you know, and there's just not enough. And, um, I don't know. I think this is such a problem today where we feel like we, um, you know, I feel like it's comparison that, that kind of um, puts it forward because on social media, like, it's interesting. I feel like the bar keeps getting raised of, like, how many followers you have to have in order to be, like, relevant or cool. And it just keeps going up and up and up. And it's, like, it's only going up because you're comparing yourself to others. Like, if we weren't comparing ourselves, like, we would be completely happy with the circle we have or with what we have. Um Let's see. Let's go to page 23, though. And this is a discussion I really want to dive into. Uh, we talked a little bit of, about this the other day. Um, it says, I see the cultural messaging everywhere that says that an ordinary life is a meaningless life. That I have that in my book, too. I love that right there. It's so sad. Like, it's so sad. Hello. Oh, oops, gosh, my. It's Ollie. Like, people keep ringing my doorbell. And I keep trying to make them go away. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> I'm doing book club. I, yeah, I'm in an important book club meeting. By the way, everybody, in a few minutes. Yeah. It, actually, that might have been my COVID test. Um, I'm getting COVID tested, and uh, so you guys all get to see me get swabbed up my nose. Um, you guys, sorry, real quick. My. <laughs> this office is at our front door and someone just came to the door and i'm like i can't pretend that i'm not here because they didn't see me and my kids are all out looking out the window mom somebody's here so i'm like i'm just doing my stream <laughs> oh that's amazing okay, anyways. <laughs> caitlin because you look girl. you look like such a gamer <laughs> Is the microphone. Oh, I <laughs> Every time I touch it, something beeps. So this is not my wheelhouse. Oh my like, gosh. It's weird. Okay. Anyways. I'm dead. <laughs> okay. But I want to talk about this thing though, that there's all these messages everywhere saying that an ordinary life is a meaningless life. So I'm going to just open that statement up to the committee. Oh my gosh. I'm not feeling very ordinary right now. <laughs> so. <laughs> I feel like. I, mean, I know, like, I. This is something I struggle with, like, terribly. Um, so I put a lot of my value and worth into um, what I'm accomplishing or doing. And um, we've talked so much about this, but it wasn't until I think I read this, that I was like, I'm afraid of ordinary not being enough. But ordinary is enough. Like, why is that not enough? Like, like I think about, well, for me, the remedy, I have a remedy to that, like um, practicing Eucharisteo, which is a form of gratitude and, and um, ex expressing um, gratefulness. Uh, because whenever I do that, like whenever I start going down the vicious cycle of, again, I'm not enough or your life is, you're just ordinary or whatever, which is um, the rabbit hole I tend to go down. I stop and if I look around and see like what I have, I realize how blessed I am and how um, it's not ordinary. It's beautiful. Like it's the everyday beautiful. Like I have beautiful kids and awesome husband. Um, I have so many things that so many don't have. And, in fact, like I just bought a sign that says, and this is something that I needed to see. It said, um, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. 
Um, and Mother Teresa said that, so I got that printed big because to me, I had connected so much of my worth and my value into into serving other people in a different capacity, whether it was homeless or the vul- you know the most vulnerable population. But my home, it's a beautiful place to raise. If everyone had um, to, you know, if everyone had a, st- a stable environment where they were shown love and kindness, <laughs> half the world's problems would be gone. And so anyways, this to me like spoke out like crazy because ordinary is so beautiful, but we forget. Absolutely. I, I feel the same way um, uh, being a mom too. I, I feel like I've felt this a lot. Like, uh, I'm just a mom, just a stay at home mom. So ordinary because like I was a teacher for a while and I felt like at least I could say, I teach eighth grade, you know, I have a full-time job. I'm a teacher. I'm making a difference. Like, and now being a mom, I catch myself and people say like, oh, so, you know, what do you do? Do you work? And I'm like, oh, I'm just a stay at home mom, you know? And I feel like kind of like a loser saying that because I feel like I'm not doing enough. I'm not, you know, helping enough or something. And then it's the same exact thing as you said, Jenny, I can change the world by loving my family and being there for them and being the best mom I can be and realizing that being an ordinary mom, that's like awesome. And I get to wake up every day, be there for my kids. And so instead of not feeling good enough, I have to learn to live in the moment and realize like, I'm everything to my kids and I am good enough. And this is what I'm supposed to be doing right now. And it's awesome. So it's just reminding myself of that when I get into those phases. Thank you. Vivian, I feel like you have something to say as well. Yeah. Yeah. So um, going along with that, I think that in all of um, different stages in our life, we can feel like we're too ordinary, right? Like if if you're a teenager and you don't have enough likes, so maybe it's because I'm too ordinary. I don't have that many people liking my my posts. Or if you are a mom and, you know, you do say, well, I'm just a mom. And where did that just come from? You know, like that is a big, big thing to be, right? Um, but what I actually thought about, I don't know if there's any fans of The Office, but um, I've watched the whole thing too many times to even, yeah, it's embarrassing. But um, I love how it's just a show about normal people doing normal things in an office, right? They're all pretty ordinary. And it's so fun to see their lives just kind of like unravel. And you are, you pretty much are so interested in this very ordinary thing. And at, in the finale, um, Pam actually says something when she's leaving the office and they t- she, she's being interviewed, right? And she says... Yeah, this is, I mean, I never thought that people would do a show about us. I mean, like, we're not interesting, right? But then she said, there's a lot of beauty in ordinary things. And she said, isn't that what life is about? And it is true. That's what, I mean, ordinary (laughs) is all we have, really. Like, all of the things that maybe make us cooler or make us less ordinary are very superficial. And what makes us worthy is our ordinary selves if that makes sense (laughs) love that that's beautifully said thank you thank you all your comments were so good everybody um and i've i had some thoughts about this as well because i i feel like i've i've always feared that like you know what is that really stuck out to me the fear of being ordinary and then is that a bad thing and like is anyone really ordinary like we're all different. Like no one really is ordinary. And I just think about like, it talks in here about like the seductive nature of celebrity culture and measuring our lives against, you know, what we see in reality TV and how that seems like it's not ordinary. Um, You know, and I've gotten to live, you know, very, what, what probably looks like very grand experiences and very, a very unique life in terms of like a lot of the people that, you know, were raised around me. However, I am no happier now than I was before I got here. Like, happy, like, I think we all want these things because at the end of the day, we think it'll make us feel better about ourselves. We also think it will make us happier if we have more things and if our life is more exciting, if it's less ordinary, like, that'll make me feel special. And I actually don't feel very different. Like, my self-esteem, my, my happiness. And so it's interesting to think about 
like if anything, it's been a little bit harder to balance my life and keep myself happy and my, my, my self-esteem in the right place. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to talk about is my sister, Brooke, is like my hero. She's the coolest person I know, aside from you I ladies. Love Brooke. No, she's, she's yeah, Brooke she's is the amazing. best. Brooke's cool. I tried to convince her to join our club. She yeah. turned me down. <laughs> I know. So maybe next time we'll get Brooke. But she's cooler than us. She could be a guest. Author. Yeah. She's an author of your book. She could be our guest one time. She could. Hold on, guys. My my COVID test is here. So well, I was just thinking about how, um, I don't know, I love, ooh, I give me cringe, like how the unsung heroes, anytime I learn about someone, like whether it's in like my uh, spiritual gospel study or in history, but like people who were not people we know the names of immediately that weren't on the forefront of like yeah. praise or whatever, you know but that did important things that set in motion other things or whatever. And it just reminds me that like, even these ordinary people who maybe aren't like these huge historical figures or people we know the names of were essential to like things in history and in our lives. Like, I don't know, I like, I wanna be one of those unnamed, like the woman that they reference you know, in the scriptures or like someone that like, you don't know my name. I'm kind of mysterious, but I did something good. And then I just kept going. Like, I love, I love the idea of the importance of ordinary people doing small things, but that are also really, really important. Yeah. And I bet all of us can think of people like that, that like did something so, what seems so small to them, mm -hmm. but was so huge. That, you know yes I think and, all of us can think of that Somebody. the real difference in life I think is always made by ordinary people like in ordinary situations you know because honestly we are all ordinary and we are all not ordinary like at the end of the day we're all people you know and um mm -hmm. the biggest difference is never made by like j-lo you know posting something on instagram or the president of the United States, like giving a great speech, like the real difference happens in the home, You're like, or a conversation with a friend, like yeah. that's where the real difference in life and the most important moments happen is like not in the spotlight, like it happens person to person in like real situations, in ordinary situations. So ordinary is, it's beautiful. It's what we all are, but at the same time, we're all so unique. So we're, we all aren't deep totally totally yes <laughs> it reminds me of the quote that's like um to the world you may be one person but one to one person you may be the world mm -hmm. and that always like brings me back to like yeah like to my kids for example I am their whole world right now and so it just reminds me that like it's okay that I'm not like famous or whatever I I am the world to my kids, my friends, you know, so. Someone Even says, then. someone oh. said, oh, I've never heard that quote. I love it. Um, someone else said, you may mean everything. Or no, we are all extraordinary to somebody. I like that. Okay, oh, sorry, Caitlin. I, like I was going to say, <laughs> I was just going to say, Vivian, are you reading all these Spanish comments? You should I translate. Am. Let's do yeah. real time translation. Go. Just kidding. <laughs> There's so much. Every time I, I see one, I'm like, oh, wait, Vivian can read it. Next time I see it, I'll. They're long too. So I'm gonna oh, read. so someone's given us some knowledge in Spanish. Yeah. Dedicated. <laughs> oh, actually, someone says don't translate. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Are they inappropriate? Don't do it. Filter them. <laughs> um, someone says. Feel good at that. Someone also said, we meet no ordinary people. Everyone has something amazing to offer. Um, very hello. true. What do you guys do, though? Because, like, hello, LSS. Because um, I feel like I, I say that stuff to you guys. Like, it's so easy for me to see your goodness. Like, you know that you're not ordinary in my eyes or the people around me. It's it's that I f I'm going to toot my own heart. I feel like that's a gift I've been given is to see like people f for 
not perfectly, but they have that how they have worth. Um, but it's so hard for me to flip the switch and put it on myself. Like, I don't know, like what are practices that you guys have done or people in the comments that have really helped you to internalize that for yourself? Does that question make sense? Yes. Yeah. So hard. It's so hard. I think it's hard for all of us, so we're like, uh. okay, comment, people. We need the help. Yeah, yeah we that. need it. Give it to us. Well, Have you? I think that's that's why we're probably just we are our worst enemies and our worst critics. So it's so hard for us to feel like we're doing great things, but it is really easy for us to see that others are doing great things. Does that make sense? Because we're always trying to be enough for each other, for for ourselves. If that makes any sense. Yes. You know, it's harder to see it on us than it is to see it in others. Have you guys yeah, ever that. done, sorry, have you ever done the exercise where you just like go to some of your closest friends and I know it's weird, but ask them to tell you what they think your gifts are. Like, not like compliment me, but like, I, I forget. Yeah. There was a book I was reading. It was like a, well, you know, what is the word? A self-development book. And it, there was like a little assignment in it to do that. And so I, I did. And it, so asking people, what are my gifts? Because sometimes we can't see them. Sorry, Janny, go on. No, I was just going to say, like, I, I like, hate this. Like, when any time I've studied anything, it's like, it always says, like, the love that you can show yourself, the empathy that you can show yourself, the compassion that you can show yourself is only, um, or others, is only as much as you can show, show yourself. And I hate that. Like, hey. Yeah, it's like, no. <laughs> but one thing for me is that, that really does help me is is actually looking at other people and seeing how much I love and care for them for everything that they are and 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 truly saying then it must be true for me too like if I truly believe that Lindsay and Vivian and Caitlin and Whitney have this beautiful innate worth about them I can't deny that that not, must not be the same for me and, but it is like a daily practice. Like I have to choose to see myself through the lens of worthiness and, and, and through I am enough versus the lens of I am not enough. And it's a day, I think it is a daily practice. And I think it's, you know, all of these things that imp are influencing us around us to tell us otherwise. Um, but yeah, I, for me, it's like, I look at others and I say, I truly feel that. I, I know that with all fiber of my being. So how can I de deny that, you know, within myself? And then when you truly start to believe it, it's almost like the door opens to even see it more in other people. And you're yeah. able to serve more and show kindness more because there's more grace anyway. So I do hate that thought of you can only love and connect and as you know. <laughs> rough one. That is a rough one. <laughs> Um, so I want to talk about, um, we might have already talked about this kind of, so we might not have as much to talk about, but, um, how have we become a shame prone culture? And actually I, I don't fully know the answer, so I would love someone to maybe talk about it. Like, and what does it mean to be a shame prone culture actually? Cause she talked about that several times and I was like, is it just the way that, I mean, does anyone have an answer to that? Well, I feel like I see what other people are doing more, like the way that we have the capacity to see inside everybody's lives. And, and so it help, it makes it harder because when I see something that's working for someone and I don't do it that way, I feel shame. And so I feel like I justify like what's, wrong like what oh it's it's only working for them because their life is this way or whatever and I don't know I feel like I compare myself and that creates a lot of shame within myself and then I I know I you know pass that on to the people around me even though I'm trying to be better and I'm not a bad person <laughs> no thank you I, I I think comparison comparison is for sure the root of of it and it's just gotten worse with, you know, um, Instagram and social media. So it's it's hard not to compare yourself and feel shame. Right. It's, and also, I thought this quote, you know, well, yeah, it says that uh, we measure ourselves against the fictional life we've created for someone else. 
you know, or for everyone else. Because really, you're just kind of connecting the dots you see on their, you know, their profiles that you see in a glance, you know, and then you create this like fictional life. And she even talked about like, how we do that with our past sometimes. And I can completely relate to that. I saw that, yeah, when she talks about nostalgia, we just kind of compare ourselves to even our own selves. Back yes. In the day, right? And you do that a lot. I do that a lot, you know, where it's like, oh, back when I was in college, that was just so fun. And I didn't have like any like things to worry about. And I mean, that's like self sabotaging, you know? It's like, <laughs> why are you comparing yourself to your younger self, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, well, because there's something, it's a beautiful thing about the the mind, but I feel like we honestly glorify memories, you know, yes. like a lot of times, like, I mean, really hard things will stick out, but the things that we think about a lot of the time are like the good memories, like, which thank heavens, that's kind of the things that seem to pop out, but at the same time, they become almost fantasized and like turned into you know, because all we remember is the great times. Like I remember in college, like when we would play pranks on the guys down the street and like when we'd go to those dance parties and like these fun, funny, hilarious times. But I also was like, oh yeah, I was anorexic. And in between those moments, I was really struggling. But if I don't clearly think about it, it's easy to be like, well, I was so, yeah, I was so fun back then. And like, my life's boring now, you know, whatever we do anyways. So well, we compare our worst self to people's best self. And we even do that with ourselves. Like when you think about a picture that you had that you like, oh, look at me in this picture. Well, that was like a really good picture of you. But half of the others are like, <laughs> right? Like, but that's like what you think of. So it is so true. Like we do that all the time. Our worst self is the best self of others. Or even we do that with the side of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, this is crazy because the other day or yesterday or two days ago on Marco Polo, I was telling you guys how I was feeling so bad about myself. And that really, that type of feeling bad about myself hasn't happened in a while. And it is related to this, you guys. I was like, I was thinking of my past self and like comparing myself to my past self. Mm. And like things were coming up from my past and I was just feeling like not good enough. And it's just crazy. Like, but this is exactly what I was going through the other day. It's just comparing myself to my past self, which isn't fair because I'm different now. And I'm actually a better version of myself, but I get caught up in like, oh, I used to be that way or this way. And it's just not fair to do that to ourselves, to compare ourselves to anyone or our past selves. And I think one of the hardest things about studying, like shame, disconnection, empathy, all these things is it triggers us. Like it brings up yes. and, emotions and then we're like oh what the crap do I do with these right like it gets so heavy and so I know and I think I even said this too like do you, or, you know when I recommended certain books I'm like do you have a support person you can talk through with this because sometimes they do they bring up such heavy things like for example you know for you um when, when you experience that if you don't have some think about if you don't have somebody that you fully trust or love and you start to harbor on those feelings, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And that shame keeps, you know, compiling on us. And so it is so important when you start even reading and reading this stuff to have a support network and people that you can communicate with and that can and that can remind you of your worthiness and your love and how much they love you. It is hard work. Yeah. I wanna share a comment that someone sent into the email. They said, and I thought this was so cool. This is Nick, and let's see, uh, where is he from? Oh, I don't, actually, I don't think we know where he's from, but he's reading along with us, and he says, he liked the quote, worrying about scarcity is our culture's version of post-traumatic stress. And then he continues, I completely agree with this statement because the situation is mirrored in my country, but in my reality. But in my reality, instead of calling it an epidemic of narcissism, I would call it an epidemic of cynicism, which affects all ages and social groups in my country. That's why becoming being wholehearted is constant wrestling, both within yourself and against society imposed norms of behavior and lifestyle. And I believe that her guidance from this book can really help to succeed in everyday life. Um, Anyways, I thought that was really cool how like a different perspective from a different part of the world. I'm not sure where he's from, but I um, thought that was really powerful. I love that. What, Cause what he's in the book, it's 
because I'm going to read what he said again, because this really hit me too. This time, well, I wrote, this time is hard, that was me. But then it's so many people have been through so much. Worrying about scarcity is our culture's version of PTSD. And scarcity is that not enough. Um, it happens when we've been through too much. And rather than coming together to heal, which requires mm. vulnerability, we're angry and scared and at each other's throat. And isn't that like what we're, like, it's so, it's, so um apparent in everything right now well rather yeah. than coming together to hill which requires vulnerability which is so scary because we're afraid to be shamed we're angry and scared at each at each other and at each other's throat i think i've seen this more in the last year than ever before in our culture like it's crazy how we, we live in a world where people are becoming woke which is great. The people are becoming aware of more issues. And there's a lot of guilt that comes with that when you realize that, oh my gosh, I didn't see this issue and I haven't been there for this group of people in the past. You know, I remember feeling a lot of guilt over the last years as I learned about different things. Um, and so what does it do? It makes you start to be a little harsher on other people who aren't there yet in the same place that you just barely got to. And so it's like, we have to be so, like rather than lashing out at each other, like, be kind wherever someone is in their process. Um, you know, if they haven't come to the, you know, and also maybe they never will come to the same opinion as you, but like, rather than lashing out, like, being kind about it and asking and accepting wherever someone is at. I don't know if that even makes sense, but. No, it's exactly why empathy is just absolutely essential to where we're at right now. Like, it's yeah. so essential because we don't know where people have come from and what they've experienced. And um, we oftentimes try to try to, dis to think we do and we put judgment and blame and all sorts of things. But when we practice empathy, we're not looking at it through our lens, we're trying to see it through their lens. Yes. It, it doesn't matter if it's, on, it doesn't, yeah, we all need to practice that. No matter what phase or space or place people are in, like the more different that someone is from you, the more you need to practice empathy with them because you have no idea the shoes that they've walked in. Um, well, and that's how you create a space for people to grow, and that's how you create a space for people to learn to come, you know, to whether they're trying to meet you where you are or wherever like come just come to a greater understanding of any type of person in a different culture or a different lifestyle than you are it's you know being able to i don't know you i can't get my words out, I can't get my words out but um it just gotten so much worse because we're choosing to divide ourselves and say i am not what you are because i'm this but rather than doing that saying you know I have a different idea than you, but we can come together and be unified in this way so that we can create a space where we can heal and learn together. And um, I, I, we had this conversation when we were with you last in um, California, but um, just, <clears throat> I want so bad to, for there to be a way where we can interact with people who have lives different than ours where we're not coming to them as a charity case or we're not coming to them like because you're different than me but just i wish there was more places where we could just be with more hi he's so cute um <laughs> we could be together and learn from each other in a way where it wasn't like i'm coming down to you or you know you're coming right. to me because i have more than you or, i love i love Lindsay and your christmas concert um, I thought it was so touching that story you shared about, I can't remember the man's name on your mission. Dave. Yes. Dave. And like how we talked to, how you talked about how we're all at some point in our lives, one of the least, mm -hmm. or we're all at some point in our lives in desperate need of something. And, um, it may not be today. It may not be tomorrow, but I hope when I'm in that place, I have someone as kind and gentle to me. Um, as they possibly can be. And I and I think that's how we have to even look at others. Like, we're all just, I, I think most people are just trying to do the very best that they can. And um, and yet we're so harsh and unkind to one another. Um, but if we, again, come to this place where we recognize we all are in need of something, right? All of us. And we um, show that love and kindness um, and acceptance, then 
magic happens, influence happens, kind of like what Caitlin was talking. Then dialogue takes place and conversations can happen. I can guarantee you I have never been influenced by someone that hated me, ever. Mm -hmm. Never, ever. But if somebody has shown me kindness and love, even though they may think completely different than I do, I'm I'm so much more willing to listen. And that's why I love Mr. Rogers so much, which that's a whole other story because, um, anyways... Like, I've, yeah, I've never been influenced by somebody that's hated me, ever. Someone in the comments said a really cool thing. Um, Chanananugan. <laughs> the problem is that the woke scolds always try to alienate anyone who hasn't caught up yet. They would rather use shaming tactics than having a conversation and understanding for people that have different views. And many of them may not be... Um, as socially aware you know so just like seeing someone in a different space and then someone else said like who's to define what's right or wrong in certain situations anyway like sometimes it's just opinions um my favorite thing that you said Janie, is like we're all doing the best we can and any time like and i truly believe that 99.9 percent of people are always really doing the best they can. No one wakes up in the morning and is like, I'm going to shame someone today. I'm going to hurt somebody. Like, you know, hurt people, hurt other people. And so everybody's really doing the best they can. And when you're having an interaction with somebody, if you can honestly, like, remind that to yourself, I think we would all be so much kinder because we'll, we'd realize, like... Happier. And happier. Because mm-hmm. yeah. you wouldn't take it personally. It's not like, oh, they hate me. It's like, oh, they're just doing the best they can, you know? And um, I, I think that's a really powerful thing and I I think we do have to wrap it up I just want to say like thank you guys that was such a cool conversation I loved everything that all of you shared um we didn't even get to actually we talked about most of the things I wanted to talk about so I'm excited about that um one last thing I just want to share is that the opposite of scarcity that we've talked so much about is not abundance it's enough the opposite of scarcity is just enough Like, we don't have to have abundance. We don't have to crave, like, being everything in life for everyone. It's like, it's just being okay with having enough and feeling like you are enough for what you have. And I think that's the most beautiful thing about this chapter. Um, But uh, we're going to do this again next week. We'll be reading chapters, should we do two and three? Yeah. We'll do chapters two and three, everybody. So you can join us next week. And... um, Thanks for coming, guys, so much. This was fun. It was so fun. Thank you so much. Okay. Oh, and they can send us stuff to that email, right, Lindsay? What oh, yeah. You it? guys can send. Like, some of the comments I read were from the email. So there's – um, or they can do it on Discord. Yeah? Both. Yeah, I would say send to the email, sterlingsbookclub at gmail.com. All right. Love you guys. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.